Okay, guys, here we go. As you are getting settled, the, <coughs> excuse me, the topic for your notes today is precipitation reactions. And guys, as you're getting settled, I'd like to talk with you about the summer quizzes you got back. <laughs> this got crazy. <coughs> so 65 points on the quiz, right? But as I was thinking about how to process the quiz, I was thinking, let's make it worth 50. So I had Matt, my TA, go through and turn your score out of 65 into a score out of 50. And then I went to put that in the grade book and I thought to myself, this doesn't make any sense. To make this worth 50 basically means that one quiz is worth more than most of the homework you're going to do this quarter. See what I'm saying? Because every homework you do is worth five or worth 10. And so all of a sudden, one quiz becomes worth more than, more than half your homework for the quarter. And that didn't seem equitable to me. So then I did some more math and I made it out of 25. So what you'll see in the grade book is a score out of 25. Now realize that that score in the grade book is actually the, the product, literally, of two roundings, right? Because first your score was out of 65, then it got converted to out of 50 with some rounding up. And then I took that number again and divided by two and again rounded up. So some of you were thinking that you had to retake the the quiz because you were below 90%. And after those rounding processes, all of a sudden you're gold. Um, <clears throat> so guys, the bottom line is this. If you look in your grade and the quiz is actually a score for your grade and it's not excused, that means you're done. However, if you have a score in there that's in bold and it says does not count, no count or excused, it means you're below that 90% threshold and you need to take it over. Let's not start thinking about retakes until next week. Good? All right. So guys, with all of that said, grab your books and open up to chapter four. Page 115. Y'all on page 115? Read the title. No, 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 not out loud. You got it? You get it? Guys, what is all, and by the way, this unit and the test over this is going to be the Friday before um, Labor Day weekend, which is nice because you don't have to try to remember this over Labor Day weekend. Guys, this unit will be chapter three, which we're done with in chapter four. So this is it. This is the rest of the material, chapter four. So guys, what's the rest of this unit going to be about? Just from having read the chapter, what's the big idea? What does aqueous mean? Dissolved in water. Guys, everything that we're going to talk about for the rest of this unit will be dissolved in water. Okay, so today what we're going to talk about is this. When you have substances, specifically salts, that are dissolved in water, and when they react together, one of those dudes don't dissolve in water anymore. Remember precipitation? Okay, then what we're going to do next time is we're going to talk about acids and bases. But guess what? Acids and bases have to be dissolved in water. Then, guys, we're going to talk about redox chemistry, which we haven't done before. And all redox chemistry is, is reactions that happen in water where the atoms swap electrons back and forth. Okay? Then, guys, the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about dilutions and titrations, and then we'll take the test next Friday. Get the idea? So that's it. So guys, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about precipitation reactions. Now guys, in order to do this, we've got to get there first because we've got to understand some bigger, more general concepts about what happens when things dissolve in water because this whole thing is about things dissolving in water. So guys, today is going to be this. 
we're going to talk about some general ideas about what happens when stuff dissolves in water. Then we're going to talk about precipitation reactions. And then over the following three days, we're going to chip away at the other aqueous reactions that you need to know. So guys, this is where we're going to start. General properties of aqueous solutions. So guys, when we talk about solutions, we need to talk about the types of solutions that exist. And guys, it goes like this. There's only two kinds of solutions. Holy smokes. I'm going to bleed to death. Look at that. This is what happens when you try to give your 100-pound Labrador Retriever a bath. Holy smokes. No, my dog's coming around. She's still an idiot, but she's less of an idiot. But yeah, you remember that, right? There were times last year where I was trying to figure out where I was going to take her in the country and bury her. I mean, seriously, I was really having conversations in my head about if I do go out and shoot her and bury her, is that wrong? <laughs> Will there be like eternal consequences for that? I quickly came to the conclusion the answer was no. Um, and then I figured out that my kids actually love this dog. Yeah, and we kept her. Okay, so guys, solution types, right? So it goes like this. Both of these are solutions, which means stuff dissolves. But when stuff dissolves, stuff can dissolve in one of two ways. Here's how we differentiate. We've got to be able to answer this question. What is necessary for a solution to conduct electricity? Do you guys know the answer? Not electrons. We understand that electricity is a flow of electrons, but guys, this is how we differentiate solution types. One type of solution does conduct electricity. There's another type of solution that doesn't conduct electricity. So we need to understand the answer to this question first. In order for a solution to conduct electricity, what does it have to have? Okay, so what is, it comes down to electrolytes for those of you that have started to look at chapter four. But guys, what, what is an electrolyte? What is required to conduct electricity? It's kind of impurities, but there are other impurities that don't conduct. All right, let me just tell you. Charged particles. Guys, the bottom line is this. For a solution to conduct electricity, it has to contain charged particles. So, guys, think about it this way. This is pure water, right? H2O. Is H2O a charged particle? No. Water does not have a charge. Water molecules are polar, therefore they stick together with intermolecular forces, but water molecules don't have a charge. Therefore, does water conduct electricity? No. Guys, water does not conduct electricity. I mentioned this to my students last year. Guys, if you're in an electrical storm, there is no safer place to be than in a pool of water. Water does not conduct electricity. So why do they clear the syrup pool when the storm comes in? It's all the stuff dissolved in the water. So we know that the syrup pool water conducts electricity, right? So what do you know about the stuff that's dissolved in the water in the pool? Those particles are charged, and that's the connection. Charged particles can carry current because current is a flow of charge. So to carry charge, you have to be charged. Does that make sense? But the other thing that has to be true is this. Those particles have got to be able to move. You should include that in your notes. Guys, that's why salt does not conduct electricity. If you have a big old chunk of salt and you try to pass a current through it, it will not work. So think about this with me. This is what salt looks like, right? Positive sodiums and negative chlorines. We've got charged particles in salt. These are positive and these are negative. Why does salt not conduct electricity? 
They can't move. So what do we do to take care of that? We dissolve it in water. When it dissolves in water, now we've got sodium ions and chloride ions, and they're moving all over the place. And now we've got the two things that are necessary to conduct charged particles that are free to move. Do you understand the distinction? You're okay? Okay. <coughs> That's interesting. If you don't confuse this, so you understand, right, that if you take salt and dissolve it, then the particles can move through the water, right? If you take salt and melt it, okay, so not dissolve it, but physically heat it enough to melt it, it will also conduct electricity because the sodiums and the chlorines can move. Not because they're dissolved, but because we broke the lattice by melting it. Remember when things melt, the structure breaks? It'll still conduct electricity. Yeah, yeah. You guys okay with that? Okay, so somebody mentioned the word electrolyte. Guys, the term electrolyte simply describes the difference that we just talked about, and it goes like this. First of all, non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes do dissolve in water, but when they dissolve in water, they don't form ions, therefore they don't conduct electricity. Guys, an example of this, because it's great to have examples, is sugar. Does sugar dissolve in water? Absolutely. Does sugar ionize in water? It does not. Therefore, it is what we call a non-electrolyte. It does dissolve, but it doesn't break into ions. Therefore, there's no charged particles. Therefore, it doesn't conduct. Alcohol is not an electrolyte. Yep. That's another great example. So maybe, guys, we should talk about what do they have in common? They're covalently bonded. Sugar is covalently bonded. Alcohols are covalently bonded. They are molecules. When molecules dissolve in water, they don't form ions, so they don't conduct electricity. <coughs> that was a great example, Spencer. Okay, so let's look at another, let's look at the other side of the coin. Electrolytes. Guys, it's the opposite. Electrolytes are also soluble in water. The difference is this. When they dissolve, they do form ions in solution. Therefore, they do conduct electricity. And an example of this is something like table salt. So ionic solutes, like salts, are electrolytes. So guys, once you've got all this down, what I want to do is offer you a couple animations. I showed these to you last year in general chemistry, but I want to share them with you again just to sort of allow you to reconnect with this idea of electrolytes and non-electrolytes. We did talk about this last year briefly. Today, it's a much more important concept. So are you ready? No. How about now? Are you ready? Vanessa? Vanessa said we're okay to move on. Are you okay? Okay, so guys, here we go. Did, 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 ah, did Miller show this to you? You don't remember. All right. <laughs> <coughs> so guys, here we've got some water. Remember, water is molecular, therefore it's not charged, therefore it don't conduct electricity. And in comes what, oh, did you see it come in? There it is. What could it be? And we zoom in and it's table salt. So guys, now we zoom into the table salt and I love that they actually did this in a consistent way. They represent table salt with the grays and the greens, just like our picture, our model, only it's flat, it's two dimensional. In come the water molecules. Guys, why is it that these water molecules are attracted to the salt? They're polar and these poles are attracted. We're gonna talk a lot more about this later, but these polar water molecules are attracted to the salt ions. They surround them and carry them off in solution. These ions are now charged, they're ions, but they're freely moving in solution. As a result, wait for it, wait for it. 
there they go. As a result, if you try to pass a current through, my timing's way off. If you try to pass a current through salt water, what's going to happen? Will it conduct? It will conduct because, not because the water is conducting the electricity, but because the positive and negative sodium and chloride ions allow that current to travel through the solution. Yeah. So you have to have both positive, positive not to conduct electricity, but you can't have one without the other. Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? Um, both the sodiums and the chlorides conduct but one without the other would conduct, but you can't have one without the other because if you've got a positive, you've got to have a negative. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys good? You love it? All right. Then what about this? Same game, different character. Oh, same, same cube, right? And you're thinking to yourself, look, it's salt again. Oh, would you be wrong? <laughs> it's sugar. Now, guys, it, it is the same image. In the words of Mr. Ellingford, it is important that you see the distinction. If this were a sugar molecule, and I've thought about trying to build one of these, but frankly, it would be wildly expensive. If this were a sugar molecule, we would not have sodiums and, oh, sorry, if it were a sugar crystal, sorry. There's, if it were a sugar crystal, it would still look like this. It would be a repeating lattice. The difference is that these points would not be sodiums and chlorides. They would be, in this case, C12H22O11, C12H22O11, C12H22O11. So they would, each one of these points would be an enormous molecule. Now, that enormous molecule is held together with, inter, with, with covalent bonds. But guys, what is it that holds these molecules to each other? Intermolecular forces. Okay. This enormous sugar molecule is polar, and the polarity of one molecule holds it to another molecule in a crystal lattice. Now, when water attacks sugar, where does the sugar break? Do the molecules break apart? No. Where does it break? At the intermolecular forces. It's always the weakest point that breaks, right? And the covalent bonds within the molecule are wildly strong. So when it breaks apart, it breaks apart at the intermolecular forces, and these sugar molecules come off intact. <coughs> so guys, these molecules are coming off intact as C12H22O11 molecules. Now, are these sugar molecules charged? No. They are molecules. They are not ions. Because they're molecules, they don't have a charge. So they do dissolve in water, but they don't form ions. Consequently, if you try to pass a current through sugar water, will it conduct? will not, as you'll see here in a second. And that then is what is called, wait for it, a non-electrolyte. Get the idea? Good? All right. Yeah. Well, sort of. So they're not, I've seen animations of it and we could try to find some. I don't have it embedded in this. Josh's question was, is there a way to visualize the way the electrons from a current are actually moving through the solution? Um, it involves contact that these things have. So broad brush strokes, it goes like this. When you pass a current through a solution, the electrons from the conductors, the electrodes, will actually jump onto these charged particles, creating an abundance of charge which doesn't want to stay there. But there's actually a pressure from this direction saying these electrons can't move back this way because there's already more electrons there. So the only choice they have is to move in the opposite direction. And as they do, they travel from one charged particle to the next through contact until they come out the other side. So, yeah, but 
we could look for anime. I've just never seen one that really said, man, we need to see that. Go ahead. Absolutely, by definition, and that's actually what the next slides are about. It's a great summary. So I'm gonna put the cart before your horse though. If it's an electrolyte, let me say it. No, I'm gonna put your cart where it is because there's other examples. <laughs> if it's a salt and it dissolves, because there are some salts, you guys ready for this? There are some salts that don't dissolve, right? Solubility rules, right? So if it's a soluble salt, it has to be a strong electrolyte. If it's a molecule, it has to be a non-electrolyte, okay? There are other things that are non-electrolytes and there are other things that are strong electrolytes, so that doesn't complete the class. So salts, if they dissolve, are always strong electrolytes, but there are other things that do this too. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but what you said is good, yeah. Um, sort of, because electrolysis involves charged particles and current, um, but there's another step to it as well where many times you're forming molecules, but it is, it is connected. Okay, so guys, let's, let's run where, where his head was headed. Guys, now we need to flesh out the list. So what are the strong electrolytes? And so guys, here's where we are. You ready? What is an electrolyte? It's a substance that conducts electricity when dissolved in water. What is required to conduct electricity? Charged particles. Now guys, within this categorization that's electrolytes, you're gonna find out that there are strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. Strong electrolytes do this very well. They create charged particles that conduct. Weak electrolytes do it less effectively. So let's talk about them. Strong electrolytes, guys, completely ionize in water. They completely break apart. So what are the things then that completely break apart in water? Well, guys, the first one are, um, oh wait, never mind. We're gonna talk about examples in a minute. We'll, we'll classify it now. So guys, when we then talk about strong electrolytes, we're talking about things that are strong conductors of electricity. Sorry, we'll give you examples in a second. I jumped ahead in my brain. But then, guys, there's another category, category of electrolytes, which are the weak electrolytes. Weak electrolytes only partially ionize in water. And I'll show you videos, videos of this in a minute. Weak electrolytes only partially ionize in water. As a result, here's a term you learned last year, they reach equilibrium. Remember equilibrium where they're going two directions at once? And those equilibria typically exist between ions and molecules. You know what? I don't like molecules because this could also be slightly soluble salts between ions and non-ionized non particles. That's better. Just one second. Huh. Sparticles. There we go. So guys, when they reach equilibrium, it's not just molecules. So we're gonna say they reach an equilibrium between ions and non-ionized particles. It could be molecules. It could be slightly soluble salt crystals. Go ahead, Josh. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're gonna talk about at great length on Thursday. These are the weak acids. Those would be molecules, yep. And so guys, what you're going to find out then is that these are weak conductors of electricity. So Josh's head is jumping forward and he's saying, what are examples like weak, weak acids? Because what I wanna do now is I wanna give you examples of these and we're gonna summarize this. And this will be part one of what we're doing today, which is this conversation about the fundamentals of solutions. So it goes like this. These are the things that you need to know that are strong electrolytes. You ready? This one you already know. All soluble ionic substances, which we call what? What do we call? Strong, no, no, no. What do we call 
ionic salt. What do we call the ionic substances? Salts. These are the salts. So guys, these are the soluble salts. This is why you need to know solubility rules. But it also includes another group of highly soluble ionic substances, which are the strong bases. Technically, the strong bases are salts. They're hydroxide salts, right? Sodium, lithium, rubidium, potassium, cesium, calcium, strontium, barium, those. That's pretty good. Um, guys, those are all salts. They're all hydroxide salts. But I thought I'd include it just in case. Now, guys, there's only one other kind of strong electrolyte. And you already know what they are. Strong acids. The strong acids are also strong electrolytes. But guys, the trick is this, and I don't know if any of you picked up on this. For example, HCl, for those of you that actually passed the quiz, is HCl a strong acid? It is. But guys, this bond that exists between the H and the Cl is covalent. It's not ionic. So if this is a covalent bond, what does that make HCl? Is it a salt? What is it? It's a molecule. All of the strong acids, you may want to write this in your notes, all of the strong acids are molecular. There is no ionic bonding in any of the strong acids. It's always molecular. It's always covalent. Okay, so those are your strong electrolytes. The soluble salts, the strong acids, and the strong bases. These are your weak electrolytes. Your weak electrolytes are the weak acids. So which ones are the weak acids? You guys memorized all of those, right? The weak acids? You actually did, and you didn't know it. Yeah, the weak acids are actually all the acids that aren't strong. And there's thousands of them. So guys, the bottom line is this. It's really process of elimination. If you know the seven strong acids, and guys, what does it mean that the seven strong acids are strong? What does strong mean? They completely break down, right? So guys, if you've got the seven strong acids memorized, it means you also know all the weak acids because anything that isn't strong is weak. Okay? In addition to that, uh-oh, drawing dots. In addition to that, the weak bases are also weak electrolytes. Guys, the one that you really need to know for this class is ammonia, NH3. And then guys, there's one other type of weak electrolyte that you need to know, the slightly soluble salts. And we'll talk more about that in coming months. Okay, you ready for this? Let's play a little mental game together and make sure you got this straight. Sort of follow, don't try to write any of this down, just think through this with me. You got a bucket of water and you got one of those conductivity meters, right? Like you saw in the video. Mr. Miller built one of these a couple years ago and we almost killed a couple people. <laughs> it was actually, he, he, took, he took a lamp, don't do this. He took a lamp and took the, cord from the lamp you know there's two conductors in the cord <laughs> he separated them and then cut one of them in the middle of the cord right can you picture do i have anything with a cord really bad okay so never mind yeah and then he he stripped the ends of those two wires and now you've got a conductivity meter you plug it into the wall and you shove those stripped wires into water and if the light lights up it's an electrolyte really bad idea but okay but guys imagine that you have a bucket of water you ready a bucket of water and a conductivity meter you ready so let's talk about the possible permutations so you've got a bucket of water and you dump in a substance and it doesn't dissolve. And so here's your choices. Weak electrolyte, strong electrolyte, non-electrolyte. Okay? 
Those are your three answers, your three choices. Weak electrolyte, strong electrolyte, non-electrolyte. If you take a bucket of water and if you dump something in and it doesn't dissolve, is it a weak, a strong, or a non-electrolyte? None of those. Guys, you got to understand this. If it doesn't dissolve, it doesn't even belong in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is all about stuff that does dissolve. If it don't dissolve, it's not a part of this conversation at all. Do you understand? Okay, so now let's do this. You got your bucket of water and you dump something in and it dissolves. And then you stick the conductivity meter in it and it doesn't conduct electricity. Weak, strong, or non-electrolyte? Non-electrolyte. What could it possibly be? Sugar or something else that is molecular, which means it contains what kinds of bonds? Covalent bonds. You okay? Yeah. The, yes. Understand, guys, that there's two words that you should never use in this class. And I know you didn't, but you were close. Never use always and never use never because there's always an exception to the rule. So are, are there some organics that actually function as electrolytes? Yes. But what's that? Acids are not organic. Weak acids, there are some weak organic acids, but there are no strong organic acids. So don't confuse molecular with organic. Organic just means contains carbon. That's a perfect example. The all organic acids are carboxylic acids. They contain that COOH group, and those are examples of weak electrolytes that are also molecules. Okay, so guys, but the bigger, oh, go ahead. Um, can I ask a question between like, the difference of strong and weak electrolytes? Please, good. What if kind of weak electrolyte, and so it was connecting versus it's weak? Yes. It didn't light up. It lights up a little. It will light up a little. It'll, it'll offer a lot of resistance, so it won't light brightly, but it will light up. That's a great point. So guys, are you okay? If it doesn't light up at all, it's a non-electrolyte. But did it dissolve? Do non-electrolytes dissolve? You bet. They just don't conduct electricity because they don't form charged particles. What's the difference between a non-electrolyte and something that doesn't dissolve? Something that doesn't dissolve. So sand. If you dump sand in water, it doesn't dissolve. That doesn't make it a non-electrolyte. That makes it non-soluble. Do you see the distinction? So when we, t and this is a common misconception, guys, understand non-electrolytes do dissolve in water. They just don't ionize. Do you see the difference? So an example of non-soluble would be sand. Okay, so guys, so we've covered the one. If we dump it in, it does dissolve, but it doesn't conduct. Now, what if we dump it in and we stick the, and it dissolves, and we stick the conductivity meter in it, and it is bright as the day? Strong electrolyte, what could it be? Soluble salts, strong acids, strong bases. Is that still on the board? There you go. Okay. Okay, now as Vanessa was getting us to think about what if we dump it in water and it dissolves and we stick the conductivity meter in it and it, and it glows dimly. Weak electrolyte, and again that could make it weak acid, weak base, partly soluble salt. Are you okay? Yeah. Does partially soluble mean that part of it's dissolved and part of it's sitting in the Exactly, and so if you, that's exactly what it means. And so if you had a partly soluble salt at an at a molecular at an atomic level, you would have at the bottom of the water flask, you would have a pile of that salt. And if you could zoom in at the atomic level, you would see ions from the salt going into solution, like we saw in the terrible videos. But all the while, some of those ions would be re-precipitating on the crystal, so the net change would be zero. That's called the, and I'll show you about that in just a minute. Go ahead, Josh, just a second. Um, concentration. Slightly soluble salts have molarities on the order of like 10 to the negative sixth. They're very low molarities. 
what you're talking about with the saturated solution where you just can't put anything more in solution, the process is the same because they both reach equilibrium. The difference is the concentration. Um, those concentrations tend to be a lot higher. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. So, while well, I was I was doing the filtration and I was putting the KOH into the beaker, mm -hmm. and I was actually and I didn't even have to like zoom in. I could just see that, that it was sort of like like when you uh, hot <coughs> tea, like, it was sort of acting like that down the bottom, and I was like, huh. Hmm. So you. No, you can like see individual things, but you can mm -hmm. tell that's where all the stuff. Where things were happening. Yeah, and sometimes what you're actually seeing are density gradients. In the same way, if you look off into the distance, if you're on a flat road and it's hot and you see those waves coming off of the road, those are actually density gradients in the air because hot air is rising and it's less dense. Sometimes those are density gradients. Uh huh. Exactly. Okay, guys, so let me, let me offer this to you. Let me offer this to you as a summary. See if this jives with your understanding, and if it does, we'll move on. Hydrogen chloride is a colorless gas, which is soluble in water and benzene. Sorry, guys, let me explain to you what you're seeing. This is actually hydrogen chloride gas, HCl. Guys, hydrogen chloride, HCl, which you know to be a strong acid, is actually a gas. All of the strong acids before they go into water are gases. So this is HCl gas. They are going to bubble it through a beaker and then here they've got the uh, they've got the they've got the lighty uppy thing. Hydrogen chloride is a colorless gas which is soluble in water and benzene. First, pure water is poured into a beaker. So guys, when they pour the pure water into the beaker, will the light light up? No. no. Water has a very low conductivity, and the bulb remains unlit. When okay, so now they're bubbling, and you'll see it off to the right. Right here, they're bubbling HCl gas through the water. It is now forming hydrochloric acid but we've established that HCl is a strong electrolyte. What does that mean it's doing? What is it doing if it's a strong electrolyte? Breaking into ions. And guys, let me ask you this then. Is there any HCl in this beaker? As we're bubbling HCl into the beaker, is there any HCl in the beaker? No, because the minute those HCl molecules, the second those HCl molecules hit the water, they are broken apart by the water into H ion and Cl ion, and they only form ions. That's what makes it a strong electrolyte. Notice that they then conduct electricity. When chloride gas passes into the water, it dissolves, and the bulb shines very brightly, showing that the solution is conducting. Ions form because water behaves as a base, accepting protons from the hydrogen chloride. We get the hydronium ion and the chloride ion. In the last... Okay, now we're going to do this with acetic acid. Acetic acid is a weak acid. If it's a weak acid, will it completely break apart? No, but some of it will. So what will you see with the light bulb? of the experiment, we are using a weak acid, acetic acid. We pour 0.1 molar acetic acid into the beaker. And the light bulb glows less brightly, showing that the solution has only a small conductivity. Acetic acid is a weak acid and is only slightly ionized in water. So guys, let's talk about this. If we could look, if we could get inside of that beaker and see what's in there. This is acetic acid. This is what it breaks into. There's your charged particles. Here's the question. In this beaker, is there any of this? A lot. Guys, this is actually about 97% this 
We'll do the math in March. It's about 97% this. It's about 3% both of these. That's what makes it a weak electrolyte, and that's why the bulb glows dimly. Do you see the distinction? Please. The solids. Yes. Um, no, it depends on concentration. And so no matter how much water you add, it'll always, there will always be stuff that's not soluble. So long as you don't run out of salt. Right? So, so for example, if you threw vinegar, a little bit of vinegar into the ocean, yeah. it's all going to break apart because it's got so much water it could go into. So there are limits if you take this out to infinity. But for the most part, what you're saying is, is true. Go ahead, Josh. No, it's not generating current, it's simply conducting it. Yeah, it's, yeah. There's a power supply somewhere. They're plugging it into the wall somewhere. Yeah. You guys okay with solution types? Okay. Now, guys, for some of you, this is going to make you wildly uncomfortable, but you just have to trust me on this. Stop taking notes. Trust me. I know. Guys, but here's the problem. When I tell you to stop taking notes, the thing that happens in your brain is you say, oh, this must not be important. Because this is wildly important. What I'm about to do is I'm about to teach you the way that... <laughs> You're okay. I'm about to teach you the way that we are going to represent chemical equations, chemical reactions for the rest of the year. And if you don't learn to do this, you're stuck. Because the way that you are accustomed to representing chemical reactions, reactant A plus reactant B yields product C and product D, that's gone. That is not how you will represent reactions anymore. I'm going to teach you today to, what are, to write what are called net ionic equations. This is really important. It's so important that I don't want you to take notes because some of you get crippled by the note taking process and you get so consumed in what you're writing that you're no longer learning. So guys, please just trust me, don't take notes. In a second, once we've built the foundation for this, we'll do one together and I'm going to ask you to write that down. But for now, for just please trust me, don't write this down. So guys, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about precipitation reactions. You already know what a precipitate is. A precipitate is a substance that does not dissolve in water. You may remember the lab we did with all of the squirt bottles, and you mix things back and forth, and you found out that some of the salts that formed were not soluble. They formed chunks, and those were precipitates. You remember that lab? Okay. Well, guys, what you need to learn to do today, and we don't need to watch precipitates form. We've already seen it. So, guys, what you need to do today is then tie that concept to the idea of solubility. So, guys, grab your solubility tables, the ones that you kept out. And, guys, in order to understand precipitation, you need to know the solubility rules. These, are, of course, are posted on page 121. But guys, what I'd like to do with you very briefly is suggest to you summaries of that table. What is it, 14.1 or whatever? So guys, you ready? This is what I do with 14.1. And again, guys, this is what I do. It's worked for me. You may choose to do more or less depending on, first of all, your ability to memorize things. And second of all, your comfort level with not knowing but guys, this is what I've done with these tables. I have simply made a mental list of all the things that dissolve in water. You ready? So let's talk about it. What are the things that always, quote unquote, dissolve in water? So the group one and heavy group two salts, which are the heavy metal bases, but it's not just the hydroxide forms of those. It's basically any form of that. Anytime you have a group one, remember, group one or heavy group two, that's calcium down, those ions tend to form soluble salts. What other things tend to dissolve in water? Acetates and nitrates. What else? Sulfates. 
halogens, let's come back to those in a minute. There's one other that almost always forms soluble salts, ammonium. Now let's talk about the halogens. The halogens do tend to dissolve in water unless they are bonded to which three atoms? Silver, mercury, one, and lead, two. Okay? That's as far as I go. And that has served me well 90% of the time. Guys, you could stump me easy. But those are the ones you really need to know. So commit those to memory. I would propose to you that that would have got you through the quiz. Those are the ones you need to know. Okay, so with that as a background, guys, here's what we're going to talk about. All, well, not all, but most, most precipitation reactions are double displacement reactions. So, guys, what we're going to do is actually we are going to write uh, and include subscripts. Let me make sure this is really the one I want you to do. Yeah, it is. Um, is it the same? Yeah, it is. So, guys, let's do this. I want you to do this in your notes. So, guys, precipitation reactions tend to be double displacement reactions. So, please, in your notes, write the balanced equation for this reaction, including the subscripts for phase. So, one molar lead to nitrate reacts with 0.5 molar potassium iodide. What on earth does the molarity have to do with the problem? Nothing. So why is it nice to know they have molarities? Tells you they dissolve in water, right? Guys, when you see molarities, that's the AP authors feeding you solubility information. In order to have a molarity, you got to dissolve in water. So you immediately know the subscripts for those things. What are they? AQ for aqueous. Gosh, with all that said, I may as well just catch up with you. Now, if I do, this will go away, and then you'll all freak out. So lead to nitrate, potassium iodide. Lead to nitrate, potassium iodide. Y'all okay? So let's do this together. I know, I know, I know. Just come on. Lead to nitrate. Guys, lead to nitrate, that's still writing in white, lead to nitrate is this. Some of you are going, wait a minute, I thought it said lead to, why aren't there two leads? That's the charge. Lead is plus two, nitrate's minus one, that's lead to nitrate. Is reacting with potassium iodide. This is a double displacement reaction. So who does the lead hook up with, the potassium or the iodide? The iodide. But iodide is minus one. So one of your products is PBI2. And then your other product is KNO3. Now you're saying to yourself, wait, where's the other nitrate? We started with two and ended up with one. It's not balanced properly. Why is this one potassium and one nitrate? Because potassium's plus one and nitrate's minus one and you need one of each. Now let's balance it. One lead, one lead, two nitrates, one nitrate, so we need a two. Two potassiums, one potassium, so we need a two. Two iodines and that balances. You okay? So guys, this is something that you should be able to do as a result of what we did last year. But you will never do this again. This is gone. This is not the way that we will represent this reaction. So now, let's go here and let's talk about the new stuff that you need to understand. So guys, again, please trust me, don't write this down. You are never again going to write what you just put on the board. What you just put on the board is what is called a molecular equation. Molecular equations show the complete chemical formulas for all the reactants and products. But guys, that is not what you are going to do ever again. What you are going to learn to do is write what are called complete ionic equations. Complete ionic equations show all the soluble strong electrolytes. Oh boy, that means a lot to you, doesn't it? What is a strong electrolyte? 
completely breaks apart, right? You're going to write those as ions. Just a second. Then what you're going to do, guys, is you are going to get rid of what are called spectator ions. Those are the things that exist on both sides of the equation. And when you cancel those out, you end up with what is called the net ionic equation. And that's how you're going to represent these. Go ahead. It is a little, yeah, yeah. I was thinking that too, but didn't figure I'd mention it. We could get rid of the word soluble, right? Yeah, I agree. And guys, this is how we're going to do these. We're going to do these by writing what are called net ionic equations. So a net ionic equation is the re equation that remains when all the spectator ions have been removed from the complete ionic equation. So now you're asking yourself, what on earth does that mean? Well, guys, join me back here and let's wrap up the day by doing that process to this. So you ready? Imagine what we've got. We've got ourselves, you don't need to write this down, we've got ourselves a beaker, right? Now, one of the things that we threw inside that beaker, going back to the original question, was it one molar? What was the molar? I don't hear it. One molar? One molar? One more, one point one, whatever it was, some molarity KN or PBN led to nitrate. So guys, think about this. If you have lead to nitrate solution, listen carefully because this they will kill you on the AP test for. If you have lead to nitrate solution, do you have any lead to nitrate floating around in water? What did it turn into? Well, guys, what that turned into was leads and nitrates, right? When that goes into water, it's a strong electrolyte, and it breaks into lead and nitrates. So we're going to write it that way. We are going to write this, do this with me, as leads and two nitrates. Yeah? Now, guys, what about the potassium iodide? We know it has a molarity, so is it a strong electrolyte? Yeah. So when you dump Ki in a beaker, is there any Ki in the beaker of water? No. It breaks into Ks and Is. So we're going to represent it that way. But notice the balanced equation, two Ks and two Is. Now, gang, it's time for products. Lead to iodide. Is it a strong electrolyte? No. It doesn't dissolve in water. How do you know? Right, because all halogens dissolve in water unless it's bonded to silver, mercury 1, or lead 2. So what's going to happen to this? It's going to precipitate and fall to the bottom of the beaker in a pile as PBI2. Right, so, but you don't have to put subscripts on it. In net ionic equations, guys, you don't need subscripts. You'll see why in a minute. Now, guys, what about the KNO3? Does KNO3 dissolve in water? All nitrates do. 2Ks and 2NO3s. So guys, now watch this. And I'm going to switch to a horrible green color so it stands out. Ready? Watch, gang. Where does the lead start? As a reactant, what's the lead doing? It's dissolved in water. How do we know this is dissolved in water? It has a charge, right? So lead starts dissolved in water. Does it stay dissolved in water? No, it ends up as a lump at the bottom of the beaker. Nitrate starts dissolved in water. Where does it end up? Dissolved in water. It doesn't get to do any chemistry. It's a spectator. Where does potassium ion start? 
Dissolved, dissolved in water. In water. Where, does Where does it end up? up? Dissolved, dissolved in water. It doesn't, it doesn't do any, do any chemistry. chemistry. It is a, it is a spectator. Where does, Where does iodine, iodine ion start? start? Dissolved, dissolved in water. water. Where does it end up? As a, as a lump at the bottom of the, of the beaker. beaker. So, so it's, it's, it's chemistry. chemistry. So the bottom, so the bottom line, line is this. this. Wet, 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 that's ugly. So guys, so guys, the bottom line then is the chemistry that actually actually place in the beaker, beaker was, was a lead ion hooked up with two iodide ions and and it formed lead to iodide. This is the chemistry that took place in this beaker. Did the nitrate your chemistry? No. no. And guess and what, guess guys? What? You ready for a deep, deep thought? thought? Nitrate, nitrate never does never chemistry. chemistry. How come? come. It's always it's soluble, soluble, right? right. And, and guys, in I this case, case, did the potassium, potassium get, to get to do chemistry? chemistry. No. no. And it seldom it's does because as a group one metal, it's usually soluble. So guys, the nitrate and the potassium didn't do any chemistry. The lead and the iodine did some chemistry and bonded together to make the insoluble lead to iodide. That is the net ionic equation. And that, guys, the thing that's circled is the way that you will represent the reaction that was originally given to you right here. So from now on, oops, I got to go W. Guys, from now on, when you see something like this that says this, here's the, oh gosh, sorry. Uh, I need to go up. I can't apparently draw around. So guys, when you see something like this that says here's the reaction, the balanced equation for that which will always now be a net ionic equation, is what we had circled previously. So you need to learn to write net ionic equations. How do you do it? It hinges on solubility rules and your ability to compare the before and after and figure out what things are changing and what things are remaining dissolved in water. You guys okay? Okay. So guys, that's where we're going to wrap up today. Let me do this. Here is your homework. Please also remember on Thursday, you need to turn in your chapter four outlines. Guys, I'll turn on the announcements. We'll go when the bell rings. So guys, in review, we will grade this homework next time. We'll collect chapter four outlines next time. Please don't turn those in late because you're going to be kicking yourself in the butt when you have a B plus in this class simply because you lost points on your outlines. Turn them in on time. And then guys, we will talk about acid base chemistry at least superficially next time as well. So guys, we'll go when the bell rings. Good day today. Well done, good and faithful servant.